John. I think most of you know that the first three locomotives the V&T used were made by Union Iron Works in San Francisco. And what I want to do is uh, talk about the engines, why they were different from the later engines, a little bit about the, uh, about the Union Iron Works. Well, just so we know that. <laughs> That's a nice rendering by John Davis, and uh, I played your ice and juice. There we go. Okay, Union Ironworks was founded in 1849 by the Donahue brothers, Peter, James, and Michael. They were machinists and foundrymen from uh, back east, and they started making whatever was needed out of iron for the uh, gold rush. Obviously, a lot of mining equipment. In 1863, Donahue brought in Henry Judson Booth. And in 65, when the Donahue's had got kind of bored and wanted to do other things like build railroads and stuff, um, Booth bought him out along with uh, George Prescott and Irving Scott, uh, both of whom were well-known names and had their own companies eventually in, uh, in San Francisco. Now, what did they do? Well, as you can see by the ad over there, they did a little bit of everything, including it using all all the fonts in the uh, printer's <laughs> type <days. laughs> But uh, pumping works, quartz mills, anything to do with, with the mining industry, power, and so on. And here's, of course, all the employees uh, standing out for the compulsory picture. So in 1865, they decided they would start building locomotives. And the first one they built was the California. San Francisco and San Jose, and it was heralded in the papers. People, whoops, this is the other one. Yeah, there we go. People made sketches of those. That's a nice one I found at the uh, State Library, all hand drawn. Took pictures, the mining and scientific press wrote it up. It was a great thing. We have a locomotive builder in San Francisco, although Vulcan had been building locomotives. And what not. Anyway, they thought Beauty and Iron Works was doing a good job. Then the second one, they repeated another one for the San Francisco and San Jose. And then serial number three was for the Sacramento Valley, but the uh, Central Pacific boys bought out that railroad and decided the engine would be better served on the CP, so it went to there, the AA Sergeant. <coughs> then another one for the San Francisco and San Jose, well, San Jose, the Union, serial number six. Four and five, I don't have pictures of, but they were little 060Ts used for the coaling railroads on the uh, uh, Mount Diablo. And again, you know, for the last one, this was written up in Engineering Magazine, which was a London-based magazine. They thought enough of it, as was the Samson, serial number seven. And again, serial number eight and nine look pretty much like this, again, for the Black, uh, Black Diamond Railroad on Mount Diablo. <coughs> then they sort of got back to a 440, which is for the California Pacific, the Calistoga, which is a nice, nice looking engine, I think, anyway. And then, January 30th, 1869, the V&T ordered two locomotives from UIW. Now it's kind of funny that all the other locomotives they ordered, with very few exceptions, were from Baldwin. So, so, and Baldwin had like 30 years experience at that time, where UIW had four. So why order from Union Iron Works at all? Well, the V&T was owned by or driven, I should say, by William Sharon, who worked for the Bank of California. Many of the mines and mills were owned by the Bank of California. The Transcontinental was not completed in January of 69. They had a few more months to go, so they would have had to ship locomotives from Baldwin around the Horn, which meant they would have get, gotten there, who knows how long, three, four, five months. 
The Bank of California was also promoting the growth of California. William Ralston, uh, who was driving the whole bank, he was, he was very much into investing in California industries. And since the bank was pretty much running the railroad, they probably thought that it would be uh, consistent with their values and their aims to order some California built locomotives. So they drew up a contract for two engines, two 260s, able to go around tight curves, $30,000 for both to be delivered in May and June, made in installments, $5,000, six weeks apart. And this is a copy of the original contract that was in the BNT's order books. And you can see the notations down here. They did pay their bills on time. And uh, thanks to Wendell Huffman, I got to get copies of these. Uh, we'll go over some of the specs. They went on for like four pages. And a lot of them were typical boilerplate things the union probably used in all their stuff. But there were some interesting things. First of all, the engine was to have six wheels, two of them without flanges, and space to go around very tight curves. If you, if you look at the, the drawing over here that Mike Collins has done <coughs> for his presentation, you can see the drivers are spaced equally apart. And the ones on the, most of the Baldwin engines and the uh, Booth engines were closer together. Again, that was to get them around the curves. The cylinders were to be 14 by 22, and drivers would be 40 inches in diameter. Pilot truck, 26 inches, and spoked. They were going to use a Roscoe oiler, which is this gadget that keeps the cylinders from drying up, and a Graham spring balance safety valve, a Radley Hunter smokestack, a Williams headlight, this little guy here, an extra large sandbox, well that's useful on hills obviously, Russian iron boiler jacket, and this I find interesting, they call that reamed rivet holes in the boiler. Well, if you've seen the boiler, you know the boilers are riveted together, and there's a couple of different ways you can put the holes in the sheet metal. One of them was by punching the metal cold, <clears throat> and that's the easiest way, <clears throat> but a lot of times you end up with microscopic cracks that'll eventually fail and the boiler uh, is rendered useless. Or you can heat the material and then punch the holes, which gives you a better cut, but they specified that these would be reamed. In other words, they were drilled and then reamed out to this precise specification for the rivets, which is unusually fine construction. And then, they, of course, they drew up a set of erection drawings which, for some reason, survived. And uh, <clears throat> this particular one is, is the, of the uh, lion in the Ormsby. And uh, it still resides in the California State Railroad Museum and is available for a, a slight fee. Uh, so anyway, it shows all the specifications, the two uh, closely spaced drivers, the size of the boiler, Everything you needed to know to put the engine together once you had all the detail parts made. So this was uh, this was due in, in middle of May, first engine. Well, on May 9th, San Francisco has a big parade to celebrate the joining of the rails, which was supposed to occur on May 9th, but of course didn't occur until the day later. But as Part of the 8th Division of the parade, it was led by H.J. Booth himself and 250 employees of UIW, all dressed in white capes with Union Ironworks printed on the back. They put the locomotive Calistoga, which we've seen, on a wagon, decorated it with flowers, and put 20 horses in front of it, all gray, and uh, towed it down the street. And then another wagon, only drawn by four horses, contained the large boiler of the first locomotive to be built for the Virginia Truckee Railroad. So here we are six days before it's going to be delivered and all they have is the boiler. 
I'm not sure why the delay. I tried to find something going on, and the only thing I could think of is they were busy sewing white cakes with the Union Ironworks on the back. Anyway, they were running late. Uh, in August, the Sacramento Union sent a boiler and frame were shipped up through Sacramento on Central Pacific cars. It didn't go up under its own power, and it wasn't towed, it was put on a flat car. And uh, the tank was, was forwarded separately, the same way. And on August 14th, the Mining and Scientific Press said, wow, they just spent, sent out a brand new locomotive for the BNT. Another one's ready to leave the shop. But at least they're catching up. So on August 17th, 7th, the, uh, the Lion arrives in Reno. And then it's immediately hauled by oxen to Carson City. Now, hauling railroads over land has been a, a pastime of the, well, of the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Thomas Jackson, several of his crew hauled about 30 B&O locomotives over land. And uh, reading the newspaper articles, you don't get any idea that this is a big deal. It's kind of like, okay, we put uh, wood things around the flange, around the flanges of the wheels, and we hooked up 20 oxen, and away we went. Okay? So, they get it down to cars and start putting it together. The Ormondby arrives at the end of August, so it's not that much later. But by September 30th, they have the first run of the engines in Carson City. <coughs> and everybody then actually believes they may actually get a railroad out of all this. Now, these engines were pretty shy. And there's only a couple of pictures of the, the uh, booth engines working on the BNT. Or maybe, instead of saying the engines were shy, maybe photographers were shy. This was the early days of photography, and it wasn't like today when everybody has a camera in their pocket and can take pictures of all sorts of stuff. But this is a photo in 1870, following a Gold Hill fire, and there's an engine working uh, up on the line there. And an enlargement is enough to see, you can tell the, the, the slope of the tender and whatnot, that it is one of the Union Ironworks engines. And that's the best view we have of either the line or the Ornaby, whichever one it was. Now, a couple months after they ordered the line at Ormsby, they placed another order. And this was going to be for the story. And the price was a little higher. 16.5, delivered by August 20th. They didn't make that date either. They were busy build, building the homes, being a lion. Again, it was paid for by installments, and you can see they actually paid. Went another half a page from the specifications. And they were a little different. Pretty much they were the same thing. They had to have six wheels, and they had to be spaced tighter. But they had bigger cylinders, they were 16 by 24 inches and the drivers were 48 inches in diameter, which incidentally was, became pretty much the standard size. All the other engines ordered after that had 48 inch drivers. Island truck was being 26 inches and spoke, spoke, Roscoe Oiler. They tried a different kind of safety valve. It's unknown whether that was Union's idea or uh, the V&T management. A smokestack with a bonnet, Williams headlight, another large <coughs> box, and a Russian oiler, Russian iron boiler jacket. And again, the London Magazine Engineering was so impressed that a couple of years later they ran a scale drawing of the story with uh, front views and side views and a couple of pages of, of text. So any of you modelers out there, uh, you have scale drawings available for both for all three of these engines. All you have to do is flip it out of a few old scraps of brass. <laughs> by October, the story arrives in Reno, and it too is is hauled by the teams of oxen uh, down to Carson. 
Now here's the only known photo of the story. This is up at the Baltic switch. And at least you can get an idea of how they were lettered. Presumably this is the factory lettering, just plain stripes with D and T Railroad, the engine name, and the Williams headlight, the stack. And of course the ever present Union Iron Works builder's plate, which to me is the fanciest builder plate I've seen on an engine. Now here's a couple of oddities with, with the locomotive. Um, the cylinders all have cylinder cocks up, down at the bottom. These happen to be opened up, have to be opened up when you start the engine. You've all seen an engine start, there's clouds of steam that come out around the cylinders. <coughs> And that's not leaks, that's coming out of the cylinder valve. Water can settle here, and if they don't get that water out, the, the water being incompressible gets caught between the piston and the end of the cylinder, and the cylinder head usually gives out, and you have a major repair to do. So you have that cylinder cox that blows the water out, and from then on you have steam operating, don't have a problem. But usually the linkage is all hidden underneath. But on the uh, Booth engines, you had this lever sticking up right in front of the cylinders, a long rod going up to the cab for the engineer to operate. And uh, very strange looking, but apparently the engines carried it all through their through their lives, and, and the damage I think would have been done apparently wasn't. Now one of the other things is that on the line of the Ormsby, you can see with the drawings that the boiler, firebox for the boiler, only came down to the top of the chassis. I mean, it was right over the wheel. They couldn't go below the axle, obviously. And, you know, there's no firebox down there. So it's very, 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 very slim, which makes me wonder how good it was at steaming. Uh, it seems to me you, you build a fire in it, and it blocks the flow of hot air through the tubes. But that's the way they were built. Push the right button. Now in the story, on the drawing, you can see that the firebox is below, or behind, the, uh, the rear driver. And it goes down considerably more. Not a very good picture, but you can see this dark thing in here. That's the firebox. So they could get a lot bigger fire going on the engine and be a much stronger pulling engine. <clears throat> so during the uh, during the lives of these locos on the uh, on the VNT, here's a few incidents. On November 13th and 69, the Lion pulled the first train into Gold Hill and followed closely by the Ormsby with another train. Later in the month, the Ormsby derailed on American flat. This was quite a common occurrence for VNT locomotives. Uh, you look at the, at the uh, dispatcher's train records, and there's usually no note. It's just instead of taking 20 minutes to go from point A to point B, it takes two and a half hours because they had to get the engine back on the tracks. So it was, if you notice some pictures, most of them carried a, a coil of wire rope with a hook on the, uh, on the back of the tender. This is why. In January, the next year, the story takes 13 cars from the North Yellow Jacket to the Santiago and, and Yellow Jacket Mills. And this, again, was a, a notable feat. <coughs> Later in the year, the story ran into a landslide in New Brunswick and was considerably damaged. That's details unknown. A week later, the Ormsby and the Carson run into each other, and the smokestack was broken off. The Ormsby and the tender was split. Again, they were back in the shops. But in June of 71, the Ormsby and one passenger car made a record, 49 minutes from Carson to Virginia. Well, that's an average speed of 20 miles an hour or something like that. So, it's not real great today's move, but at that time, it seemed pretty decent. September of 71, the story was, uh, <clears throat> they started building on the Reno division. 
And so the story was again disassembled and all the Reno to work on the Reno Carson section. I went to a Civil War modelers uh, convention a couple of weeks ago, and in it they were talking about this movement, the Confederates moving to B&O locomotives, and a lot of people said it never existed. Well, you know, they, they, they thought the task was impossible. And I'm thinking they should read the Carson City papers. They do it like, you know, every day without any, any thought to it. Okay, and then the Ormsby was taken apart. It was moved to Orm to uh, Reno as well. And they started uh, started work on the uh, on that division that was joined later by other locomotives from Baldwin. February the next year. Ormsby is running wild. Well, what that means, it wasn't a scheduled train. And uh, what we would call today an extra train, in those days it was called a wild train. So it just had to keep out of the way of all the scheduled trains. And so it was hauling wood. Uh, then in April of 73, it was kind of downgraded and was going to pull gravel between Gold Hill and Mount House. In April, it breaks a piston rod, the story breaks a piston rod, and they're back in, in a burst cylinder head. Because when the piston rod breaks, there's nothing to stop the piston at the end of the cylinder, and it just keeps going. <clears throat> and then the lion comes in to re for repair, and the Ormsby takes the lion's place <coughs> on the, as the um, Gold Hill and Virginia City switcher, and the story takes the Ormsby's place. Well, the gravel train. So they're all, they've all been downgraded from first class mainline trains to uh, yard work, gravel trains, and other less important details. They did rebuild the Lion, and then somebody shoved the engine under the uh, uh, Virginia Over dump and sheared off the smokestack, so it's back in the shop the next year. <coughs> And then in December of 74, uh, the J.W. Bowker arrived from Baldwin to take the place of the uh, Lion in Carson City. So it became the switcher, and the Lion was shoved up to Virginia City, city to do switching. The Ormsby was then relegated to the Roundhouse to await emergency. So in 1875, they have this engine sitting here, and uh, Mr. Gardner, now this is a letter from D.O. Mills, two D.O. Mills from uh, Mr. Yarrington. Anyway, Mr. Gardner has a logging contract up at Lake Tahoe and needs a locomotive. And he says, ah, instead of buying a new one from the east, why don't you rent the, uh, the Ormsby? And the reason is, she could do no good hauling freight up the hill, and for the past two or three years, used her on the ballast train, that's the gravel train, and at that she's been a nuisance. She's been pulled a few cars very slow and frequently off the track. Now they never said anything like that about the Lion, and two engines built at the same set of plans. Who knows why they were vastly different, but it's like getting two cars. Your neighbor gets a brand new car, and one's great, you get one, it's a lemon. One of those, one of those things. So anyway, Yarrington uh, <clears throat> uh, went on to say, as soon as the Bowker and Inyo arrive, we'll put her in the Ormsby uh, in the old roundhouse and let her stay there. They don't rent it out. And we'll have a lion, a far better engine, to take her place. So they, they did it. Mr. Gardner said, OK, we'll, uh, we'll rent your locomotive. So he closed the bargain. I guess he was going to rent it to, to buy, forty-five hundred dollars, and uh, here it is at work. It's renamed the Mountaineer, and it's working up at Lake Tahoe hauling logs. <coughs> and here's a close-up picture of it. Two of them <coughs> off the B and T. It wasn't so photo shy, or maybe people had more cameras at that point. Whatever. Anyway, here's two pictures. Still looks pretty much as it did. 
on the V&T. Still got the stylus arch windows and the builder's plate is still there, still lettered for the V&T, except the name has been changed about there. But otherwise, it's the same engine. In, 18, in 1880, though, they took the, uh, the V&T took the engine back from Gardner since he hadn't paid for it. And uh, so they thought that would be a better thing to do than give away a locomotive. And in 82, they used the boiler to substitute for the Carson City Engine House boiler. And in 1902, that boiler gave out and the engine was finally scrapped. And that was the end of the Ormsby. Troublesome engine, but who knows why. Hmm. Now, the railroad peaked in its hauling in 1876. So things gradually <clears throat> wound down after that. And by 1881, the V&T had way too many engines, uh, much more than they needed. And the Canadian Pacific was building a railroad, and Mr. Underdot, the contractor, needed a bunch of engines, so they, they sold a couple of uh, the Baldwins and the story to uh, Underdock and the Canadian Pacific. And as you can see, they, they, they fixed the engine all up, uh, repainted it, lettered it Canadian Pacific, they meaning the b and boys, and sent it up to uh, Canada to start working in the western end of the railroad. Here again, looking pretty much like it did when on the B&T. When it was finished, it uh, was stored for a while and sold to the Intercolonial Railroad in Eastern Canada. And it became number 188, later 23, which is, there it is there. Uh, a few things changed around. It got an extended smoke box and burning coal, but still the basic engine. And it was used for switching. And then in 1914, it was rebuilt into an 060 with a slope back tender, became Canadian National number 7082, and finally scrapped in uh, 1920. So being built in 69, that's 51 year life, which was the longest of all the Union Iron Works engines. Now the Lion lingered on a little bit more. For a long time, it was stored back beside the roundhouse in a scrap bin. Here's the lion. Here's what's left of the Ormsby. And it's just sort of sitting there, derelict, awaiting scrapping or, you know, providing whatever parts the shop might think they need. But then in 1889, uh, the Reno Reduction Works up in Reno needed uh, a temporary replacement boiler. Their boiler had given out, and they were, I guess one was on order, but they needed one right away. So they contacted the V&T and said, well, you can use our locomotive. So they hauled it up to Reno, took the drive rods off, the headlights gone, the bells gone, you know, everything that made it a locomotive, the pilot's gone. And they plumbed it in directly into the shop, and it was used to provide steam for the reduction of ore. <coughs> And it stayed there for a few months, so about three months. And then it was brought back down to Carson. And it basically sat outside. You know, everybody wondering, now what do we do with it? But at least we got some good pictures. So there's two or three taken at this time. And you can get an idea of what it is. <coughs> uh, obviously a lot better than the one in 1870. We can barely make out that's a locomotive. Here's some more of the pictures. Somewhere in one of its many accidents, the uh, builder's plate got cracked, which is, makes me wonder how that happened. But anyway. And then uh, finally it was scrapped in 1890. Now Booth went on to build 17 more locomotives for various railroads <coughs> until 1882. They built a total of 30 altogether. They already had their fingers into so many other things that we looked later. Uh, and they 
decided to stop. They did have a catalog, though, and they listed standard engines. Here's their standard mobile. They make them in a heavy freight model with 48-inch drivers. And we also have patterns for a smaller engine with driving wheels 40 inches in diameter. It's pretty obviously where those came from. <coughs> and apparently, though, uh, no, none of this pattern were ever built again, even though they were cataloged. So UIW went into ships. They've been building ships all along, and they built uh, part of the Great White Fleet, submarines, until about 1905 when Bethlehem Steel bought the yard and turned it into a Bethlehem shipyard, which lasted until about 1950. And today, there's no Union Iron Works engines that remain that I know of. However, push the right button. Lion is being rebuilt. And some of you have probably seen Stan Gentry's work. I was up there last year uh, taking some pictures and looking at it. And that's a very, a very recent picture. So progress is being made. Uh, the boiler's there, obviously, the, the uh, stack, headlight bracket, and so on. He's got a Facebook page if you want to follow. The Life of the Lion. And if you want to look, I was talking about the boiler being very shallow. Here's, here's the boiler that went into it, built from the same drawings that we just saw. And you can see there's not a lot of space here for a fire. So that may be a problem with, with steaming capabilities. I don't know. Anyway, he's building it uh, as it was originally, so seems to have gathered some steam, not to create a pun there, but uh, <coughs> seems to be doing a lot of stuff for it, so I hope he does. He's, he spent a lot of years, uh, what's the, about 20, 25 years on it now? And uh, so I hope he finishes it, man's 70, maybe 73 now. And then of course there's other models that uh, have been made. Using, I find it ironic, these are ones that I built. And I use the same drawings that he's using to make a one-to-one -one engine. <laughs> mine, mine got running first, however. <laughs> so, thanks to uh, Stephen, my colleagues, Charlie Siegenthal, they helped me out with some of the photos and whatnot. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Where was the Union Ever located in San Francisco originally? I think it shows on the first slide their address. Uh, they were in the southern part of the city, as I remember, out near the uh, out near the bay. But I can't remember exactly where. Go back to. Yep. Oh, you are. Thank you. Let's see if that gives an address. Go to the next one. Okay. Well, it doesn't. San Francisco was first small street. enough then; anybody could find first it. Yeah, first between Market and Mission. Oh, there you go. Very far, down the First yeah. Street between Market yeah. and Mission. Between First Street between Market and Mission. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't too far from what we'd call downtown. Then it was out in sticks. Yeah, it was probably just an office. I'm sorry? I'm guessing that would be just an office. No, their, their works were on Mission very early, but South of Market was outside of town. Yeah. And then over time, they moved down to um, the waterfront off of. Uh, the, the works are still there. The yeah, it was, it was in the 1890s they moved, the they moved to closer to the oast, to the bay to facilitate their shipbuilding efforts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some years ago I uh, read some of the Inyo development paperwork that's in the collection of uh, the university uh, at Reno. Mm -hmm. And uh, amongst the stuff was a letter that Yarrington wrote about the uh, assessed value of the facilities at Keeler. And amongst his uh, comments was that the boiler that they had there was from the first engine on the Virginia. <coughs> of Hawaii. So maybe when it was scrapped, it went down to Keeler. That I had not. Yeah, well, seen. it's so often. It's, 
I believe this is what he's telling the assessor is to try to get a lower tax rate. <laughs> tax rate. Uh, but, you know, it's something I have. You know, sometimes you find the information not where you are expecting to find it. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. They died. He died in the desert. Any other questions? Yes. When were they building submarines? Right, right after the turn of the century. Question. What was the question? When were they building submarines? Was the question. But I think the government started building in the 1890s. I'm not sure it's the exact data. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.